All right, so I drilled all the holes in the box for the mounting solution. You can see the inside of the box, we have two holes for each of the battery post terminals that we're going to be using, as well as uh, two grommeted holes for the actual battery cables themselves. That protects them from the sharp edges on the metal. And additionally, I've installed a port on the side for the charging jack, which is this DC barrel jack here. And I've drilled four holes in the bottom and cut out a piece of masonite, which is going to be the platform on which our entire battery rests. So the first thing I'm going to do is install all the hardware that can just be mounted up, like the battery terminals, uh, the barrel jack, and the switches. And then I will proceed to install the battery on the masonite. So I will uh, come back once these are installed. So I've installed all the mounting hardware, as you can see here. I have the uh, battery post terminals installed. I have the uh, switches here installed. And I've also installed the uh, DC barrel jack, which is going to be the power input port on this. So the next thing I want to do is work on the battery. So I have the battery here. It's basically going to end up resting on this piece of masonite. I'm going to be attaching it with some cable ties or zip ties, and then I'll be bolting the masonite down inside the toolbox so that it's uh, permanently attached to the toolbox. So I'll start working on that as it is now. I'll use my favorite material again, a piece of uh, this microfiber cloth just to protect the underside of the battery so it's not directly rubbing on the uh, masonite underneath. So I'll just, that'll just add a little extra protection, particularly for the uh, looped copper straps. I don't want those putting pressure on the 18650 tops. So the next thing I want to do is basically make sure all the conductors are out of the way. And uh, I'm going to start feeding these cable ties. I'll probably use about two of them per uh, go around. I think I'll, I'll put two ties per set of 18650s. So that'll be a total of uh, six or 12 of these that will end up being used. So I will start the process on that. So now as you can see, I've fully secured the battery pack to the masonite board. At this point in time, we're going to be able to theoretically uh, join this with the box itself. Now before I do that, I'd like to work on installing this uh, DC to DC converter onto the back side of the pack here, so that it's basically going to be bonded uh, in place when it's installed into the box. And let me tell you a little bit about this DC DC converter. So this is actually a buck boost converter. It can be both a step up converter and a step down converter. And it also operates in both constant current and constant voltage mode, which makes it ideal for charging lithium batteries. Now I have connected here a shock key diode to make sure that the output circuitry doesn't receive uh, backflow from the battery and slowly discharge the battery when uh, the charging is not taking place. And I've also installed an additional voltage divider with resistors to the underside of the board here. Now this voltage divider with resistors basically allows me to set two possible charging voltages. I can set the charging voltage to 12 volts, which would be four volts per cell, if I want to economize on cell lifespan over the long run, 
or I can set it to 12.6 volts or 4.2 volts per cell if I want high performance and long pack uh, battery life during a single charge. Now I have compensated these voltages up by about 0.3 volts to account for the voltage drop on the Schottky diode, so in reality we'll be charging to about 12.3 and 12.9 volts respectively, which at the battery and at the BMS will appear as 12 volts and 12.6 volts respectively. So that's how this uh, converter is going to work. I'm going to proceed to install this onto the battery pack, and then we can uh, proceed to set up the actual wiring for it. Alright, so now we have some more wiring to do. I've connected the DC to DC converter to the battery. I've also connected some breakout wires which are going to be used to power the voltage meter as well as the buzzer circuit which I'll talk about in a moment. And then I also have the uh, thinner wires here which will be connected to the voltage selection switch that's going to select between 4 and 4.2 volts. In addition to that I have the power input cables which are going to go around the battery and eventually meet up with that power input jack. and I've also taken the liberty of installing this PCB into this uh, plastic project box using some hot glue and additionally I'll be running some zip ties around the entire battery to hold it in place and also uh, across the actual board just as an extra precaution to make sure if it gets hot enough to melt the hot glue that it doesn't come out and then spark against things. Now I need to be a little bit careful because these wires are live, they're connected to the battery and I definitely don't want anything touching and uh, shorting things out or damaging any ICs on here uh, due to surge current. So I'll begin this section by basically uh, doing the same thing I did before with the zip ties except uh, routing them horizontally around the pack and this time I want to make sure I've got enough length that I'm going to go underneath the existing ties. Here we go. Tighten down the rest of it. There we go. So we have this battery pack engaged, or this, uh, this charging circuit engaged on the battery pack. The next thing we can do is install the battery pack in the box and start wiring up the controls. Alright, so now that I've connected the battery inside the toolbox, which by the way I've also taken the liberty of uh, bolting this in place and installing the power jack connection since those are sort of tedious tasks that are better done off camera. We can now install some of the peripheral devices that are going to be used for monitoring such as the voltage display as well as the emergency low voltage buzzer. Now this I can actually talk about. This is a little circuit I constructed myself out of uh, uh, basically an op amp and I'm using two LEDs as a voltage reference. And this is basically set up as a comparator to determine whether the voltage of the battery goes below around 9.3 volts, which would be equivalent to 3.1 volts per cell, at which point the buzzer begins to make a loud noise. Now I only want this active when the meter is selected, so it's uh, not going to be required that the meter be, uh, that it be buzzing all the time if it runs low. But since I'm not using an output BMS, because this is going to potentially be used as a car starting system, I want to have some kind of auditory notification that I'm uh, running the batteries critically low. So we'll, consider, we'll continue with this work. What I want to also do is show you how I install my voltage displays. I have a rather unique method. I end up using uh, cheap plastic sunglass lenses, and uh, I'll show you how that installation goes as well. So we can proceed. I'll start by actually installing the sunglass lens. I've drilled a hole here. I believe this is a one and an eighth inch hole, roughly. And I'm basically just going to put a coating of hot glue around the outside of the lens and basically stick it into place. The voltage display will go on the underside of that and that's going to give a nice tinted window that basically doesn't give any direct indication of the, uh, the look of the display until it actually turns on, at which point you can then view what is on the display. So I'll take my hot glue gun and uh, I'm actually going to use the convex side of things here. And on the convex side of the lens, I'm going to basically just pump out a bunch of hot glue, being fairly quick about it so as to not uh, let it go down or let it run, uh, let it go dry. And I'm going to line it up and basically just press fit it. I will have to trim a little bit of hot glue off on the other side, but that should be okay. 
And within a few seconds, it's now pretty much bonded in place. So if we look on the other side, you can see there is a little bit of uh, overrun. We can just maybe wipe some of that off. It'll, it won't be too difficult to uh, correct that little mistake there. But you can see what it's going to look like. It's this nice sort of black face, this black dome that you almost, it's almost sort of this mystery as to what's underneath it. You don't really perceive it as being like an actual window for a display. It really gives it kind of like a, a sort of retro futuristic look that I think is really cool, which goes along with the aesthetic of the kind of rusty toolbox look of this thing. So we'll pull this back open. And uh, the display is oriented vertically in this position. This is the bottom, this is the top. So if we wanna look at it from this direction and read it like this, we wanna basically have these wires facing up. So what I'm gonna do is uh, coat the face of the, uh, of, the convert or the screen, voltage screen with hot glue as well. And I'm just gonna stick that right in the middle directly to the glasses lens. Now I need to check to make sure I have clearance between this and the top of the battery as it is going to be quite close, but I checked it a little bit earlier and I believe it should theoretically work. We'll find out about that once we feed the cables through these grommets and actually close the lid up. But before we do that, I'm going to proceed with the remainder of the wiring job. So to do that, I'm going to basically start work on the switches. Now this upper switch here, which is the lower switch from the top, is going to be the voltage selector switch. So I'll do that last so it's easier to access the power switch. And the way that I'm going to configure the power switch so that I can isolate both positive and negative, and since I only had two pull switches, so I might as well use both poles, is I'm going to then solder the positive and negative conductors each to one of the center poles. And that's of course going to allow me to then just tap off the uh, output poles when I want to power the screen and the buzzer. So I'll proceed to do that. I'm going to take the wire cutters and uh, strip back a little bit of insulation here. Now this is the part, the first one is easy. The second one is going to have to require very, very precise work and a very steady hand because uh, it's going to be extremely easy to short circuit this and Although it is protected by the BMS, so it should interrupt on uh, overcurrent, I would prefer not to have to test the capabilities of my BMS this early on in the game. That, of course, is uh, something that would be rather damaging potentially to it, even if it is designed to interrupt overloads, because this battery is pretty much an unstoppable beast in terms of its power output. So I'm now going on to the positive line, which is kind of the, uh, I would say, the riskier one. And I'm going to basically configure it so that when the switch is facing in this direction, it's going to be off. And when it's, no, actually I'll have it point towards these posts when it's on. So this is going to be the off position, which means that I want to use the back side uh, connectors here since that's the direction that the switch is being run. So the positive side I'm going to be super careful about. I really don't want to cause any shorts. So I'll have it like that and flow in some solder. And then I'll see if I can kind of brush it aside as well, because it's pretty close there. Yeah, so that should be theoretically adequate uh, protection there. So I'll tuck the wires back down into the box. And that's going to be our supply for our voltage display and our buzzer. So what I probably want to do next is solder on these voltage display wires. What I'm going to do first though is I'm going to get some more of this blue wire and I'm going to hook up the buzzer and then I'll connect the screen to that same line. So I'll be right back. Alright, so I went ahead and soldered the wires to the switches for the battery display as well as for the buzzer. And I've also connected or I've also pulled the battery cables, the output cables, through the grommets so we can now see if the actual uh, clearancing is going to be okay. I have certain concerns about that, but uh, this will be the moment of truth. 
Before I do that, I can show you that uh, the when I turn the power switch on, like so, the battery voltage is displayed on this uh, black screen here. This nice blue on black looks really cool. And uh, I also have the bright LED voltage reference, which doesn't really, this is just something I threw together for an experiment. Using LEDs as a voltage reference, it works well enough, so I'll uh, leave it in. And uh, These do draw about 10 milliamps, so I definitely don't want to have this thing staying on all the time, which is why I have a switch for it. But uh, when the battery's in service, that should be a negligible amount of current, considering this is a 50,000 milliamp hour battery. So the moment of truth with clearancing now, let's see if uh, the whole thing fits. And it's a little bit on the tight side. I mean, it's not great, but honestly, I'm not too worried about that. It's, uh, nothing's really getting crushed, it doesn't feel like, and that's probably actually not a bad thing because it means the battery is not gonna shake around and break its uh, straps loose over time. Additionally, the lower of the two connectors here sets the charge voltage, and it'll stand to be seen whether that works effectively until after I've actually uh, put it on to charge. Currently, it's not doing anything because there's no charging going on. But yeah, you can see that the 10.4 volts is displayed, and if I turn that switch off, it disappears, which is exactly what I would expect it to do. So next, the uh, next thing I have to do is install my ring terminals bolt these onto the studs, and then find a good way to secure this latch closed so it doesn't pop open when I'm carrying it. It is a little bit on the heavy side, but uh, for being a 500 watt hour battery, I mean, this is basically the same amount of energy as a deep cycle marine battery, and I can carry it around easily with one hand. That's pretty darn awesome. So I'll uh, move on to getting these terminated and shortened up, of course. I'm gonna probably cut about two feet or so off of each. So I'll be right back. All right, so I've terminated the cables on the terminals, uh, terminal blocks here. You can see I basically connected these using uh, crimped ring terminals. They have two sets of nuts on them, so the lower set just holds the actual ring terminal to the terminal block, and the upper set then allows me to connect uh, other subsequent ring terminals for inverters or jumper cables or whatever else I might need to connect. Uh, alternatively, any sort of uh, alligator clamp type connectors can also be directly applied to these, whether uh, just by tightening the nuts all the way down and then clamping them directly to the exterior. So yeah, this is a 50 amp hour, 11.1 volt battery. I'm calling it the Bat Box. If you've ever played modded Minecraft, you might get that reference. And I've also labeled up the meter and V-cell charging uh, switches so I can select whether to charge to 4 volts per cell or 4.2 and I can turn the meter off and on which is fairly self-explanatory. I also added a pretty heavy-duty uh, key ring to this uh, latch so that even if it gets pressed in it's minimally likely to uh, pop open while I'm carrying it. So overall this uh, I would say has been an extremely successful build. I'll have to do some testing and try it out and then I will come back for the conclusion. All right, so I've had this thing in service for about a week now, and as you can see, I have done some minor embellishments on the labeling. I printed out this label here, Bat Box, with the uh, name of the device. And I've also built a few accessories and acquired a few accessories that go with this. Now, over the course of using this for about a week, I've had very ex exceptional performance out of it. I was able to go on a three-day vacation and charge my laptop pretty much continuously off of this with no problems during that three-day period of operation. And I tested out the charging system. I was able to charge this from zero, uh, well, not zero volts, but 0% 0 state of charge, or about nine volts, all the way up to full with no problems at all. And I was also able to test the multi-voltage setting. And indeed, when I set it to four volts, it only charges up to 12 volts total. And when I set it to 4.2, it pulls all the way up to 12.6. So let me show you some of the added features that I've acquired and set up to be able to use with this battery. The first of which is I ordered a 1500 watt power inverter. This is a beefy power inverter from Vetomile brand. It's kind of an online eBay or Amazon style uh, level of quality, so it's not a super high-end inverter. It's modified sine wave, but uh, it is very, uh, very high power, 1500 watt continuous, 3000 peak. So this will start refrigerators and run drills and power tools, blenders, that sort of thing. So pretty much anything you want to run, this thing will do. 
It doesn't run huge stuff, like it won't run a laser printer. I have trouble trying to get that to run on anything but mains power. And it won't quite run an induction cooktop. That takes just a bit too much uh, inrush power as well. But for pretty much any power tools and uh, th handheld power tools at least, this does absolutely fantastic. Uh, and it really gives you a pretty good headroom for running any sort of power equipment, including DJ equipment. For uh, slightly lighter loads or momentary loads, I've installed a set of jumper clamps on so I can easily connect this to the battery box. If I stick this on here, connects, makes a bit of a spark, of course, charging its capacitors, and then you get 120 volts AC modified sine wave out of it. So for sort of uh, intermediate level use, I'll use these alligator clamps, but for example, if I want to get a ton of power, if I'm going to be doing some seriously heavy lifting with this inverter, I also have these uh, four gauge actual like lug connectors. These lugs go actually bolt down to the automotive uh, terminals, and then it has some tinned cable that inserts into the input jacks on the inverter. So two different options for powering the big inverter. Now another big thing that I've set up is I've built a set of jumper cables. So this is these are those automotive like jump pack style connectors. And on the other end, I have ring terminals, which can also be attached to the top of the battery. I haven't tried cranking a vehicle with this because I don't want to put excessive wear on the cells. Uh, I know cranking automotive engines is one of the leading causes of death of those power packs. They can really only do it a few times over their lifespan. This one I actually think would do absolutely fine cranking cars many, many times. But since I want to get as long a life out of it as possible, I'd like to just only use these if I absolutely have to. But you can see these hook up, uh, they bolt down, and then the other sides can be connected to the car's battery, and it can then be cranked. Now I did not include a diode in line, which means for a brief moment the car's alternator will try to backfeed the battery after the crank. So it means that once you have the car running, you want to pretty quickly disconnect these so you don't overcharge this or imbalance charge the lithium battery. But the lack of diodes also reduces the voltage drop and improves the reliability of the system. I know the diodes have a high tendency to fail open when they're under those types of high load conditions. So that's another feature that I can use this for. And if I don't want to carry this big inverter around, I have the option to take this uh, smaller accessory plug adapter and connect that to my positive and negative like so. And this allows me to plug smaller inverters, car chargers, or other accessories in. For example, this 300 watt pure sign inverter from, I believe it is Best Tech. Yeah, this is a Best Tech inverter. Or if I really just want to power something small like a laptop, then I can run this Harbor Freight 80 watt modified sine wave inverter. So you can see you just plug it in and uh, green light comes on and then you have power there. So I pretty much have this uh, universal battery solution for pretty much any application that I'm going to need uh, out of a portable battery. This is absolutely a massive, massive battery. Uh, 50 amp hours is two and a half times the size of my previous Energize toolbox, which I'll link the video about in the description. And it basically cuts down on size and weight substantially by not including a full balance charger and also by not including a big 750 watt inverter. By making it just about the batteries, the box is considerably smaller and lighter in weight than my other big toolbox. Actually, the weight is about the same because it's got a lot more battery in it, but it's definitely denser. And then it allows me to choose the type of inverter or load that I want to apply on it. Obviously, I don't always need the 1500 watt inverter, so there's no sense in having it inside the box. If I want to just power like a laptop or a light bulb or something, a little inverter like this is more than sufficient. So now I'll show you a few applications where I can get a nice uh, high performance amount of power out of it. So let's check that out. All right, let's try this Makita electric drill. This is rated at 5 amps, 115 volts, and it should draw a pretty hefty inrush. Uh, it's a pretty substantial load. So I plugged it into the inverter, and let's try it out. That runs pretty well. It starts right up, and you can see the voltage barely even sags under even a 5 amp start load. Let's see, it's about 12.4 right now. Didn't even move. That's awesome. So yeah, extremely good performance on power tools. Let's try a couple other loads. Let's try a big resistive load. 
This is an 800 watt reflective space heater and I've got it connected. So let me switch that on. As you can see, the fan of the inverter comes on, but the heater is up to full brightness and we're still at 12.2 volts and holding pretty steady. That is a lot of power to get out of an inverter driven system. Let's have a look and see how it does with induction motors, like the one driving this buffing wheel. I'm going to plug this in, make sure the cord is out of the way. No problems at all getting that started. And as you can see, the voltage is still holding pretty much steady. That's nice performance from this. Both the inverter and the battery pack are working extremely well, even with just the alligator clip connections. We're not even using the heavy duty cables. So overall, I would call that a highly successful project. I've got a super high performance battery that I can use for numerous different portable applications. And I got even more experience in building large scale battery packs using the soldering method of battery pack assembly. I also set up that custom charging circuit that seems to be working perfectly. And ultimately, I produced a nice product that I think I'll be able to use for years to come. So hopefully you enjoyed watching that build and seeing those demonstrations. If you want to build one of your own, I did talk about the different uh, components and batteries that I used. And if you have any specific questions, you can leave them in the comments and I'll be sure to answer them if you're interested in building one of these for yourself. With that in mind, thanks for watching Dielectric videos, and I will see you next time.